So good evening and thank you for joining us to launch the Georgia Open History Library. I'm Lisa Baer, Director of the University of Georgia Press. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, a few words about what we're celebrating tonight. This new ebook collection includes nearly 50 open digital editions of single authored scholarly titles and two multi-volume series as well as primary documents going back to the founding of Georgia as a colony through statehood and beyond. These UGA press titles had gone out of print, but thanks to a grant from the Humanities Open Book Program of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the press was able not only to digitize the print books and create open editions easily discoverable online, we were also able to commission new forewords for each volume written by scholars and experts, including Katherine Carrison, this evening's speaker. We were able to order digital files that follow universal design for learning principles to ensure accessibility for all learners. And we can offer Kindle, Amazon Kindle, and paperback editions in addition to the open access eBooks. In short, these long unavailable titles are now reborn individually and as a collection, interactive, public focused, contextualized scholarship available in a variety of formats. Our plans for promotion begin today with this talk and the exhibit at the Hargrit Rare Book and Manuscript Library at the University of Georgia. And in 2022, we'll launch both a video exhibit and a traveling exhibit to introduce the collection to students, teachers, scholars, and citizens throughout the state and beyond. I have many people to thank for making this project possible. First, I want to thank my colleagues at the University of Georgia Press for spending nearly three years, which included some uniquely unforeseen challenges, to take an idea on paper and make it into such a spectacular contribution to our scholarly publishing mission. Simultaneous thanks goes to our colleagues at the University of Georgia Libraries, who I believe are also magicians, especially Kat Stein at the Hargrit, Sheila McAllister at the Digital Library of Georgia, and Kelly Holt in cataloging, each of whom contributed critical content and technical expertise. I'd also like to thank my boss, University Librarian, Toby Graham for his unfailing enthusiasm and support. Our project advisory board members included Kalinda Lee at the National Center for Human and Civil Rights, Ed Hatfield at the New Georgia Encyclopedia, Stan Deaton at the Georgia Historical Society, John Insko at the UGA Department of History, and Paul Presley, the Ossabaugh Island Education Alliance. Our statewide program partners include several already mentioned, as well as Georgia Humanities, the Wilson Center for Arts and Humanities at UGA, the UGA History Department, and the Atlanta History Center. I'll now introduce our speaker. Katherine Carrison is Professor Emerita of History at Villanova University where she taught courses in colonial and revolutionary America and women's and gender history. She holds a PhD in American history from the College of William and Mary. She is the author of two books. Her first, Claiming the Pen, Women and Intellectual Life in the Early American South, published by Cornell University Press won the Outstanding Book Award from the History of Education Society in 2007. Her second, Jefferson's Daughters, Three Sisters, White and Black in a Young America, won the Library of Virginia's 2019 Literary Award for Nonfiction and was a finalist for the 2019 George Washington Book Prize. Okay. 
Harrison contributed a new foreword to a colonial Southern bookshelf by Richard Beale Davis, a title in the Georgia Open History Library. After Catherine's talk, we'll have time for a Q&A. Please use the Q&A box or the chat box on your screen to share your questions. Over to you, Catherine. I'd like to offer my own thanks. Uh, first, before I begin, to Lisa Bayer, Director of the University of Georgia Press for the invitation to be part of this auspicious occasion of the launch of the Georgia Open History Library, uh, to Leandra Nessel for her technical support, uh, particular thanks to the Wilson Center for the Arts and the Humanities and to the History Department at the University of Georgia for sponsoring my talk. And of course, thank you to you all for watching. I was a brand new history graduate student when I first read Richard Beale Davis's A Colonial Southern Bookshelf, one of the books now available through the Open History Library. And it launched me on the research project that would become my first book, Claiming the Pen. In my initial forays into the archives, I had encountered letters between two young girls of Yorktown, Virginia, during the latter days of the Revolutionary War. They wrote sympathetically about an acquaintance who'd been seduced and then predictably deserted by one of those dashing French officers who had descended on the little town to help Washington's army corner the British there. And here I have a, this is a 19th century rendition of, of uh, an imagined uh, scene of uh, Count, Count Rochambeau uh, there in the center in his much decorated splendid uniform uh, standing beside the rather more soberly clad uh, George Washington as they planned the siege of Yorktown. But I remember being surprised that the girls didn't seem to accept without question the advice typically meted out to female readers to give such fallen acquaintances a wide berth, lest they be tainted by her sin. And I wondered why they didn't and how they'd reached alternate conclusions which led them to empathize with her rather than condemn her. I wondered what else they've been reading besides the usual advice essays in the Virginia Gazette that may have shaped their thinking. I wondered what gave them the courage to support their fallen friend, risking their reputations as virtuous young women. In short, I was asking questions about female intellectual life in 1780s Virginia, when I wasn't even sure there was a literary culture in the South worth studying. Davis's Colonial Southern Bookshelf, a compilation of essays from the Lamar Memorial Lecture Series he delivered in 1977, corrected my wrongheaded impressions and gave me my first encouragement that the project I envisioned, an attempt to write the first intellectual history of 18th century Southern women, might actually be possible. I begin with this story of Davis's influence on a novice graduate student because it exemplifies the deep significance of the Georgia Open History Library project not just for historians in training or just for the people of Georgia, but for academics and non-academics alike, and I would suggest nationwide. My story suggests the kind of impact these works, both primary and secondary, can have in their new open access iteration. So I'd like to address two main themes to reflect on the ways in which this open access digital library is particularly important. First, the Georgia Open History Library underscores the diversity of Georgia's early populations, 
the study of which will deepen our understanding of both the complexity of the founding period and the long shadow that era still casts today. Second, its open access will inform and will enable an informed public to challenge the narratives of those who would prefer to erase the history of those complexities. To know who we truly are as a nation, we have to look at our past, who we have been. For too long, however, that narrative was controlled by a narrow circle of elites who valorized the accomplishments of white men. These histories relegated to the margins, the peoples they exploited, from whose lands and labors they profited, and they buried the evidence of the oppression of these peoples. So controlling access to that knowledge was preeminently a political act as it sought to shore up the claims of white male authority. But throwing open Georgia's founding documents to the perusal of the many poses a direct challenge to those traditional narratives. Indeed, with so many more sets of eyes studying these documents, informed by a wider set of experiences, new histories will reveal a deeper understanding of the sheer diversity of early Georgia. And this work will not only impact Georgia, but have a far greater resonance in understanding who we are as a nation and how we have come to this moment. So Lisa's introduction described the Georgia Open History uh, uh, Library project. And uh, these, this, these volumes include the colonial records of the state of Georgia, and the journals or letters of John Percival, the Earl of Egmont, uh, which also includes the proceedings of the trustees, colonist Peter Gordon, Henry Newman, and his papers with respect to the Salzburgers settlement, and of course, papers of James Oglethorpe. Now, at first glance, this list of the papers of Georgia's leading columnists and officials may seem primed to yield yet another standard narrative of the founding heroics of European men. That is, James Oglethorpe's vision for an industrious society free of the blemishes of alcohol, the extreme gaps in wealth and slavery, but then the rapid demise of that vision with protests from both within and without, especially the migrants from South Carolina and the West Indies. But then the quick rescue of the colony by the crown, after which a stagnant economy, unsuccessful in its attempts to produce silk and wine, revived with the turn to rice. Within a generation of the imposition of crown rule in 1752, wealthy Georgians had created a mature plantation economy that rivaled South Carolina's, its wealthy and more established neighbor to the north. But within these records, a broad new range of new readers will spot the possibilities for new narratives as they find the unexpected, as I had in my Yorktown letters, and ask new questions of old sources that promote the exploration of that ethnic and racial diversity of early Georgia. So I'd like to take some time here to spotlight four broad areas of Georgia history that are ripe for further study. First, exploring the trustees records particularly between the founding of the colony in 1732 and the 1742 Battle of Bloody Marsh to study the geopolitical wrestling between the English and the Spanish as they sought to establish their place on the continent. So this is a closer look uh, 
um, at an, an image of Savannah in 1734. And I would say here that we need to consider this image as more aspirational than a true account or reflection of what existed in Savannah in 1734. But what it does show us is sort of the ways in which uh, a city and blocked out and orderly, as you see here, was actually uh, considered in, 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 by the English was a fixture of civilization, right? So they're planting um, this city uh, in this wilderness. And you can see the, the, the wilderness, of course, uh, they're trying to show this sort of separation between the city, the element of civilization, and, and that which um, harbors their, uh, their potential enemies, both indigenous and of course, uh, European, uh, the Spanish. So I think we could use these uh, trustees records to try to uh, begin to counter the view of the dominance of the English narrative of the 13 original colonies with the reality of the ever present threat that Georgia settlers feared that Spain represented to their infant colony. The Battle of Bloody March had effectively ended the military threat against the English colony, but that result was by no means a foregone conclusion for the English settlers. And indeed their continued efforts to manage their fears of the Spanish and for the security of their colony, as well as the ways in which some of these efforts led to tensions with their English neighbors to the north, are chronicled in these collections and need further study. And indeed, I've, I've found Georgia history is frequently underrepresented in the story of the contests for the continent in uh, textbooks about uh, colonial America. Second, this story must include Native Americans who were acutely aware of the several European powers who jockeyed for dominance in North America and who deftly played them against each other in constructing their own foreign policies. This was as true along Georgia's southern border, separating it from Spanish Florida, as it was along the English and French Canadian borders in the North. In their examinations of official state records, such as the colonial records of Georgia, scholars have studied the strategies of native groups, revealing them as diplomatic forces to be reckoned with. But there's much more work to be done on that front, um, but also especially studying native actors in their own right, rather than just as supporting players in the English history of the colonization of Georgia. Caroline Wigginton's uh, 2012 essay entitled, In a Red Petticoat, Kusa Ponakisa's Performance of Creek Sovereignty in Colonial Georgia is a perfect example of what I mean. And here is an image of uh, Kusa Ponakisa uh, from the University System of Georgia. Historians have frequently followed the lead of the contemporary white male observer who dismissed a native interpreter as a woman of quote, mean and low circumstance being only clothed with a red straw petticoat and Osnabrig shift, unquote. But Wigginton interpreted that red straw petticoat very differently for her. Kusa Ponakisa's choice to appear, quote, vibrantly adorned in the Creek diplomatic male color of war, unquote, was a powerful signal to her people, announcing her preparedness to advocate and fight for them if the meeting she was medi mediating between Creek leader Tomochichi and the new English arrival James Oglethorpe didn't go well. But Wigginton went well beyond reframing our historical memory of that famous first meeting. Studying the letters, interpreter reports, speeches, and more, which Kusa Ponakisa left behind, 
Wigginton made a case for her as one of the first native authors in English. Because of Wigginton's close reading of Creek culture, she could show how this, quote, Creek woman who has acquired English tools by which Wigginton meant pen, paper, and alphabetic literacy. Can, so this, this, um, these, these, this record showed how Creek, this Creek woman who has acquired English tools consistently wrote Creek culture into colonial documents, unquote. Her works are part of this online archive, inviting further research on the woman Georges today recognized more readily by her English name, Mary Musgrove. Third, of course, these records are indispensable for the study of slavery and the creation of a racialized society that in many ways persists into our own day. But unique among um, England's mainland colonial ventures, Georgia's founders, including James Oglethorpe, shown here, expressly forbade African slavery in its charter and limiting land acquisition to 50 acres per settler aimed to steer the colony away from the cash crops that had made Virginia and South Carolina so wealthy. This wasn't because Oglethorpe was opposed to slavery. Indeed, he'd been an official of the slave trading Royal African Company uh, before his Georgia venture. And he had brought enslaved people uh, to Georgia to build its first buildings there. Rather, his idea was to provide a place where the poor and debt-ridden population of England could go to achieve their temporal and spiritual salvation through hard work. In an age that attributed poverty to sinfulness, Oglethorpe, like many elites, assumed the paternalist mantle of superiority of those they viewed as the criminals who populated Britain's debtors' prisons. By constructing a society that banned rum, which they believed led men down that slippery slope to indigence and crime, and banning enslaved labor and access to the enormous acreage required for cash crops, Oglethorpe and the trustees hoped to create a haven for white men willing to work their own land. And this explains, of course, the invitation to um, other European settlers, such as the Salzburgers, the Scots, uh, and uh, a not incidental um, uh, contingent of, of Jewish settlers as well. And also the colony would prevent Spanish expansion to the North, um, thinking that white landholding farmers would have a, a, a stake in that project of defense that against the Spanish that enslaved people who fled to Florida for freedom, most emphatically would not. Well, as we know, this experiment didn't last a single generation. But rather than accepting the turn to cash crops and slavery as inevitable, we would do better to study these papers to trace out how the colony took that path in a series of considered uh, choices. This is not an incidental point. Resistance to Oglethorpe's vision began almost immediately. Slaveholding migrants to Georgia from South Carolina and the West Indies fought vigorously for the abandonment of the bans against slavery and the limits on land ownership. But there were several groups in Georgia who supported these bans. The Salzburgers, for instance, viewed slavery as, quote, poisonous to society, unquote, and it must be said, as clear competition for the skilled labor they thought only white men should provide and profit from. <laughs> 
Migrants from the Scottish Highlands in 1739 described slavery as, quote, shocking to human nature, unquote. But again, also uh, recognized it as a threat to their own safety, particularly in the aftermath of the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina that, that same year. So these protests, both for and against the ban to slavery, are detailed in the Georgia Open History Library uh, project, including the successful efforts of one pro-slavery activist to embroil parliament in these debates. And I show here a Virginia tobacco ad uh, from uh, this period, uh, the mid to, to uh, mid 17th, uh, sorry, 18th century. Um, couldn't find a Georgia rice uh, ad. Um, however, it, it makes clear the link between enslaved labor and profits. Uh, which link, of course, underlay the Georgia planters' very vocal protests to the ban on African slavery. Like Kirsten Fisher's book, Suspect Relations, Sex, Race, and Resistance in Colonial North Carolina, a study of the creation of a racialized society in 18th century North Carolina, the papers of the Georgia Open History Library offer a well-documented opportunity to study this process in detail and in a compressed period of time, in Georgia's case, not quite 40 years from its English founding in 1732 to the planter's triumph uh, by 1770. There in these papers, readers can watch the struggles play out as conflicts emerge first between the goals of the colonists and of those in the metropole who sent them, which is to say the elite planters and the trustees, followed then by the planters' resistance to the crown's efforts to regulate their slaveholding. And again, by 1770, the elite planters had prevailed here as well. Significantly as well, we can trace the ways in which these debates divided European colonists along emerging class lines. Non-slaveholders who fought to preserve their economic potential as artisans by limiting slavery and big agriculture versus slaveholding elites who were hardly going to allow non-slaveholders to regulate them. Of course, this isn't just George's story. It says something about our nation's origins that an experiment to ban slavery in an effort to have at least a rough economic equivalency among European settlers collapsed so quickly and so spectacularly. But the process by which it happened was a series of deliberate, intentional choices from which we can conclude that a racialized society was not inevitable. And again, this is important because that which was made, laws and societal practices as human constructions, can be unmade. The past doesn't have to govern our present with its heavy dead hand, unless we allow it to. So fourth area, uh, this is true for gender as well. A constructed hierarchy even more ancient than that of race that has been used to rationalize the subordination of women to men from time out of mind. And as I hope I've been making clear, the Georgia Open History Library records left by white men, including the secondary sources written by historians, do not preclude the study of marginalized people. So to return to my encounter with Richard Beale Davis's Southern, uh, sorry, Colonial Southern Bookshelf reading in the 18th century. Here Davis examined men's libraries and mostly in Virginia, focusing on three main categories. Uh, the first, 
history, politics, and law bundled together, the second religion, and the third belles lettres, none of which on the surface might seem to have anything to do with women. Still, following the map he laid out, this apprentice historian got to work on that which he had omitted, women's literacy and reading. And here is a, a portrait found in the Virginia Historical Society of Mary Jemima Balfour, uh, the, with the uh, wife of a wealthy Norfolk merchant um, and, um, and painted here in 1774. And, and so here, I think for, for us, she, she represents sort of what I discovered during the course of my research, which was um, elite women's access, access to the transatlantic world of print and their interest in it. Uh, um, Balfour looks uh, perhaps uh, slightly annoyed that we are interrupting her reading. Uh, she has marked her book uh, with her thumb. It's open at page 94. Um, but um, this, this, was, this was the world that I was, um, was researching. And interestingly, I couldn't find a portrait of an 18th century Southern woman with a pen in her hand. But in the foreword that I had the honor to write for Davis's book for this project, uh, I raised some questions that I think it continues to, to inspire um, for the people of Georgia going, going forward. For example, how might his work, again, based largely on Virginia sources, suggest ways to investigate reading practices and readers in early Georgia? And uh, for women, given that Georgia was the last of the mainland colonies to acquire a printing press in 1762, how might we begin to reconfigure what publication even means? How might the informal circulation of letters, poetry, travel accounts, and essays, that is scribal publication, further inform our understanding of colonial Southern reading and thinking, especially that of women who would be writing these kinds of things and circulating them among their friends to read. Such writings could reveal how gender informed reading practices, as well as a wider understanding of what constituted education in the colony. So having described something of the diversity of voices in these documentary records, the opportunities they might offer and their importance for both early Georgia and early American history, it's time now to turn to the significance of the Georgia Open History Library as a digital humanities project, because it's not just about the content, but who has access to it. Not everyone has access to the marvelous libraries of research institutions, which is why it was so incredible for me when I first stepped into SWEM Library as a new graduate student at William & Mary. Because there's a way in which I would have been part of the target audience for this digital library if it had uh, existed 30 years ago. You see, I was a late Bloomer, having graduated from college 16 years before I entered the graduate program at William & Mary. So when I was growing up, work remained largely sex segregated. As an undergraduate, I didn't have a single female professor. So I thought, uh, so the thought that I could pursue a PhD, which is to say an intellectual life, never occurred to me. As I began read, researching my reading and writing women in the 18th century, however, I began to realize that there was a long history that explained why I had so uncritically accepted societal prescriptions in my own day about which sex is best suited for what work. And as I studied these women, I began to understand like them, 
that discovering I had something to say and taking up the pen to say it was the project of a lifetime. For white women in the 18th century South, it was thought that the informal transmission of housewifery skills and just enough rudimentary reading ability to read the Bible were really all that women needed to know. Gendering education in this way reinforced a hierarchy of being in which women were taught that their subordinate status was instituted by divine and natural law, and that because of their nature, they were best suited to domestic duties. And this image here, um, much reproduced in a, in a, 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 a sort of a, in a variety of different ways, uh, but consistent in its, in its message was really quite familiar to 18th century readers. Uh, the message, of course, uh, literally spelled out for us, keep within compass and you shall be sure to avoid many troubles which others endure. Um, and this is a message that my Yorktown girls would have been very, very familiar with as they were thinking about the experiences of their fallen friend. Neither the intellectual or physical equal of men, it was thought, women simply didn't require any more education. Indeed, claiming the pen assumed an authority understood to be masculine. And uh, here is, is sort of an, an image of, of what that means, because here we can see um, a rather masculine looking female reader. Um, her room is strewn with all the accoutrements of femininity that her maid must now work hard to apply, uh, starting with that wig. Um, but the idea then is that once she is all made up and she has she's putting on this false front it disguises this female reader's unnatural proclivity for books and the life of the mind indeed for this breach of female modesty they could be excoriated for exposing themselves as wantonly as any prostitute rejecting their sex by writing and publishing female authors thus forfeited the protections afforded them by respectable men and rendered themselves vulnerable to all manner of assaults, as uh, many women today in public life and in the press on social media well know. This is just one way in which the control of knowledge, which is to say who has access to resources and then who has the right to think and speak and write and teach and preach, um, that that control of knowledge is a political act by which I mean it reinforces the dynamics of power that have kept women subordinate to men. Southern men also understood how critical it was to keep literacy and knowledge out of the reach of their enslaved laborers. As the female enslaver of Frederick Douglass learned, and this I'm taking from, a, a, this is a 19th century example, um, as this mistress learned from her irate husband when he happened upon her teaching the young Douglass how to read, quote, learning would spoil the best, and there he used a racial slur, in the world, her husband thundered at her, it would forever unfit him to be a slave, unquote. Indeed, runaway notices in the colonial period attest to slaves who could write well enough to forge travel passes and pass as free. And here I just pulled out one example of many uh, from the Virginia Gazette um, in, in um, April 1745 from John Custis, a prominent man in Williamsburg. Uh, uh, this first column, uh, the second ad, you can see this 30 year old male uh, named Peter can read and Custis said, and I believe write. 
1740, in the aftermath of the Stono Rebellion, South Carolina was the first colony to forbid teaching enslaved people how to write. So effective were these laws that fewer than 5% of slavery's survivors interviewed in the 1930s by the Federal Writers Project could remember being taught to read. These laws were a formal recognition of literacy as a critical tool of political power that must be restricted to whites. Funding public education today through property taxes, which create such disparate school systems for white and black children, are both a legacy of these colonial practices and a means to perpetuate them, to ensure that access to a quality education remains a privilege of whiteness. Recognizing the political dimension of the control of knowledge helps us to appreciate even more than the significance of the Georgia Open History Library Project. It's open access to Georgia's founding documents and to essential but now out of print works of history lifts the veil to the past, exposing it to a much wider audience. And that matters because when people on the margins start to formulate their own questions and then have the access to the resources necessary to answer them, they will produce new works much more nuanced than a narrative of colonization that is framed as a triumph of European civilization. Happily, the academy has become much more diverse in the decades since I was in college. And scholars in many fields have produced groundbreaking work studying these dynamics of power. But open access digital history projects expand this potential exponentially. So it's important to underscore here that those of you who consider yourselves non-specialists should not be deterred from this work and indeed be encouraged to take a dive into these records. Access to these records blows the boundaries between academics and the interested public. But I think we can aim even higher uh, than uh, just blurring those boundaries. Digital history has made great technological strides uh, in the past decade, uh, particularly uh, for public historians that have changed the ways in which the public engages history in museums, historic sites, and then particularly in the era of COVID um, online. And with funding from the National Endowment from the, for the Humanities, the University of Georgia Press and its partners have done the hard work of digitizing the documentary records of Georgia's founding. And with this launch, we celebrate that achievement. But we mustn't lose sight of the ultimate purpose of this project, which is to engage in arguments that further our collective understanding of the past. So it's now as readers, scholars, and informed citizens that our work begins to realize that which the Open History Library is making possible for Georgia. There's one more point I'd like to make about the politics of control of knowledge uh, before I conclude, to emphasize why this broader access matters so much. As we noticed earlier, these digitized records were produced largely by white men. And although I argued that that doesn't preclude our study of marginalized people, the patriarchal structure of the archive itself is a fact that we must also confront because it can easily shape the focus of our study, shape our questions, and indeed uh, then our very understanding of the past without us even noticing. So we need to be aware of this construction of the archive and the stories the archives are intended to tell. 
what was and was considered significant and therefore must be preserved and that which wasn't. And those decisions themselves were informed by patriarchal notions. Uh, in decades past, many a graduate student um, uh, was told that their study of fill in the blank with whatever marginalized uh, uh, group they wanted to, to do, um, that that study couldn't be done because those people didn't leave any written records. But that advice itself was patriarchal as it prioritized the written word, which in this period was certainly the privilege of elite men. Uh, and, and so it prioritized the written word over any other um, forms of evidence. But as one digital humanist has, has asked, what could be more ambitious, more interesting and challenging than understanding the nature of that power? The Georgia Open History Library Project provides open access to the sources that allow academics and non-academics alike to explore them from new perspective, conscious now of these past authorities who uh, ignored these people and these perspectives or mischaracterized them. The debut of the Georgia Open History Library could not be more timely as battles continue to rage over the content of history textbooks taught in American schools. And I've chosen just one uh, from the headlines. Uh, you could pull many. Uh, and this, this is from Education Week, uh, August 2021, a headline, a $5 million fine uh, for classroom discussions on race. Tennessee aims to levy fines starting at a million, rising to five million. Each time one of their teachers is found to have knowingly violated state restrictions on classroom discussions about systemic racism, white privilege, and sexism. As the insurrection on January 6 made clear, Widespread lies and the capitulation of a major political party to those lies have led to repeated attempts to rewrite history and to excise from high school textbooks and university curricula honest, critical engagements with our past. These attacks spring mostly from people who have an ill-informed view of the past, for whom access to resources like these, I, I would argue, uh, provides a remedy. The radical potential of this project is to help them understand that far from being diverted from a true understanding of the past, they're actually discovering its fascinating and complex realities. These themes, the complexity and diversity of early America and the politics of the control of knowledge are not just key for Georgian or Southern stories, they're key to the uh, national story. It's impossible to chronicle the stories of early Georgia without hearing their echoes everywhere in our own day. The powerful still prevail marshalling racist fears to successfully court non-elite whites to vote against their own interests. White supremacists still refuse to acknowledge the full citizenship of black people, straining to suppress their right to vote and ignoring their breathtakingly determined work to save the American experiment. And nowhere is that more evident than in Georgia's own Stacey Abrams and Raphael Warnick. We're all acquainted with Thomas Jefferson's famous remark that quote, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. But perhaps less familiar was his next sentence. But I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them, unquote. 
we can extend his point to the Georgia Open History Library. Good government relies on an informed citizenry and people can only be informed when the documentary record is open to their perusal without barriers to access. If there is even a glimmer of a silver lining in the challenges we face today in education and in living on the precipice of a constitutional crisis. It is a renewed attention to an interest in the early period, which is precisely where the Georgia Open History Library has begun. And as we look forward to our nation's 250th anniversary in 2026, May this digital humanities project and the work it inspires strengthen our resolve to work for the common good of we, the people. Thank you.